When 2022 first rolled around, I had never played a Souls-like before. That is until a certain little indie game came out. You may have heard of it. What was it called again? Hmm. Oh, right. Elden Ring. Before Elden Ring came out, the only experience I really had with Souls-likes were when I went to my friend's house and just watched them play Dark Souls and get completely demolished by bosses over and over again. So the only experience I really had was knowing that they were hard games. The hype surrounding Elden Ring just really made me want to buy it, so I did. And I don't regret it one bit. And Elden Ring just made me feel things. The confusion of figuring out a dungeon puzzle, the excitement of finding new things around the map, and the absolute seething rage I felt after dying to Margit to the 20th time, and that feeling never really left for the 140 hours I played the game. This game was so good that it made me want to go back and play the predecessors before it. So in November, that's exactly what I did. I went back, I played Dark Souls 1, and I beat it in like one week, and then I played through Dark Souls 2, and it was a different experience. And right now I'm basically at the end of Dark Souls 3, just finishing up the DLCs before I fight the final boss. And while I was playing Dark Souls 3, I was struck by this morbid and dark thought. And I'm sure it's a thought that has struck everyone at a certain point in time. What do I do when I'm finished Dark Souls? Of course, there's still Demon Souls, but I don't really own a PS5, so I can't really play that. But luckily, Demon Souls and Dark Souls were so good that it pretty much spawned a whole new genre of games. And that genre, of course, is called the Souls-like. Now, Souls-likes are a genre that requires no introduction, but I'll introduce it anyway. Damn it! <sighs> oh my god, he just hit me with a fucking wombo combo. Come on, bro. Don't do this. Please, I have a family. No. What? She just teleported behind me like a fucking anime character? I'm so fucking close right now. Oh my god. Die, you bitch. Die. Please. Yes! Yes! Oh my god, yes. Psh, that was too easy. Yeah, that's pretty much a Souls-like. Created by our supreme overlord, Miyazaki-san, the genre of Souls-like started with Demon Souls, but was really popularized by Dark Souls. In essence, a Souls-like contains a few key elements. Number one is the bonfire checkpoint system. Essentially, there are certain points around the map you can sit and rest at, which heals you and refills your health flasks. But it also respawns every enemy that you've killed not including bosses and mini-bosses. There are also souls, or experience points, that you gain from killing enemies, and those can be used to level up or purchase items, but they'll also be dropped on death. And basically, when you die, you have to go back and get it, or if you die again, it'll disappear. And you can imagine how frustrating that can be. Another element would be a deep and engaging combat system that involves a dodge roll, in some way. There always has to be a dodge roll. And my personal favorite aspect of a Souls-like is the deep level design with branching and interconnected paths, as well as new paths that can be opened with a key or by other means. Now this aspect is what really made me fall in love with Souls-likes. The feeling of getting lost in this world makes it feel so much more immersive, and it's much better than just following some compass or objective point. <clears throat> Assassin's Creed and Far Cry and pretty much every modern open world game nowadays. Now back to my dilemma. I really wanted to find a Souls-like game to play after I finished Dark Souls 3, and that's when I stumbled upon Kenna, Bridge of Spirits. The game was on sale for about half off, so I figured why not give it a try. The first thing that really caught my eye was the graphics. It seriously looks like if Pixar made a game. And another thing that surprised me was that I saw it in the Souls-like category. Like this Pixar, Disney, DreamWorks looking ass game is a Souls-like? Nah, -uh. there's gotta be something wrong here, I gotta check this out. There's no way. So let's get right into it. So I went with the hardest difficulty, cause I ain't no weenie hut junior ass gamer. I'm a man. So the game starts off with a brief lore summary. You can go ahead and read it for yourself, but basically there are masks that are made for the dead that slowly turn into dust to symbolize a spirit moving on. Sometimes they don't and become dangerous, and there are spirit guides that help those spirits that can't move on. And we get to play as one of them. 
First of all, I really want to emphasize how beautiful this intro cutscene is. It's definitely got to be pre-rendered. And as you can see, Kenna notices that there's a mask nearby that hasn't dissolved fully, and there must be an evil spirit nearby. And right off the bat, we're taught about the pulse mechanic. Basically, you press and release LB, and Kenna releases a pulse that interacts with crystals and other things in the environment. I walk through a dark cave and use my pulse to cause a chain reaction to open this door. I walk through that door, and we stumble upon the spirit that we were tracking. And suffering here, spirit. Do you need help? You know nothing of suffering. Clearly, he doesn't know we've played Dark Souls. This is my home, my village. Turn back, spirit guide. The combat system is fairly standard, with RB being a light attack and RT being the heavy attack. You can also use B to dodge. So it's pretty much like Dark Souls. I think I got the hang of this. No, that's a lot of damage! Or not. Yeah, I just died in the tutorial. So my first impressions of the combat was that it felt a lot faster than I'm used to. Kenna runs and attacks a lot faster than in Dark Souls, and there's no stamina bar to keep track of so you can pretty much run circles around your enemies. Alright, take two. Second time's a charm, right? After defeating those waves of enemies completely effortlessly, by the way, I try to use my pulse on the platform to open the door ahead, like before, to no avail. I realize I have to pulse these two crystal shrines to my left and right to activate the platform. Realizing that took me way longer than I'm proud of. It's a good thing I'm editing this. The platform was activated and we were free to pulse it open. I exit using that door and into a lush and beautiful forest. And as I'm running along in the forest, I notice these kids just kind of phasing in and out of reality. And for some reason, Kenna thinks it's a good idea to stare at them from behind a tree log. It looks like the kids are looking for someone. They then let their ADHD get the better of them when they notice this cute little blue thing and they try to catch it. My boy gets away from those kids with ease. Kenna tries to approach the kids and that's when they just phase shift away, which is honestly a good call by them. We then use our pulse plus the Y button to collect the Rot Wisp which is the name for that really cute blue thing that we found earlier. I mean, just look at that thing and tell me it doesn't belong in a Pixar movie. We befriend it and play with it for a little bit, and after that, our next objective is to find his friends. By now you know the drill, we use the pulse to get through the door. But now, instead of a door, it's a couple of platforms that we have to jump over. I make my way through the forest and the kids appear again in front of me. There she is! Run! I guess they don't realize there's only one way for me to go. I find another rot. Four more to go. I find rot number two and three and find out that I can play with them. There is no functionality to it other than being really cute. I find the fourth rot inside this chest. There's this red flower thing that blocks my path, but luckily the fifth rot is right next to it past this jumping puzzle. I can now use the rot to destroy these flowers using my pulse. I go over the log and then I have to Assassin's Creed myself up this building. As beautiful as this game is, the platforming is a bit too floaty and Kenna's animations are pretty stiff. That doesn't stop me from enjoying the game, though. This leads us into another combat section. When I'm in combat, the rot will only work when I build enough bravery, which is a bar that goes up the more damage I deal. Once I do that, I can destroy the flowers that spawn the enemies. I can also use them to temporarily stun enemies, which I accidentally do here. I destroy the flower and head on. I then learn that I can use the rot to move certain objects around in the environment. Are the rot my friends or unpaid laborers? Right now I'm not so sure. Nevertheless, I use them to move that stone block, which allows me to climb this ledge. You can also use the rot to pick up these statues. This nets you karma points that you can then use to unlock new skills and abilities. I head a little further and start to wonder, who turned down the saturation? Was it you? We find the spirit again. He makes a slightly racist remark. Make that too. And then he sends out a shockwave, which kind of blocks. After that, he runs away like a coward and leaves us to fight our very first boss. This is where we learn the shield mechanic in the game. I never use a shield, so by instinct I dodged. I didn't really use the shield my first time fighting the boss, which led me to die. And so close, too. I used the shield a lot more in my second try, which led me to realize it can only take about 3 hits before breaking, which will cause you to take damage. The game tells me I can activate my shield at the right time to parry enemy attacks, but the timing on parrying in this game is so difficult to get down, it's seriously harder than Sekiro. Trying to parry the boss got me killed, but I got him on my third try. 
After killing the boss, we have a talk with badly voice acted kid number one and two. Don't worry about us. We've been here a long time and take care of ourselves. At least that's something we have in common. They tell us that when the spirit in the mask shows up, the red poison grows stronger. It's revealed that Kenna is trying to find the sacred mountain shrine. She asks the kids for help in doing so. They want us to help find and free their brother Taro, who's trapped deep in the woods somewhere. We agree to help them and set off. This is an absolutely beautiful view. The perfect time for a title card. And there it is. We find the village the kids are from and clear it of its poison. This is a really cool effect. Seeing everything come back to life like this is just jaw dropping. We clear the town of its poison. That opens up the hat cart and a warp point. We can use the hat cart to just buy cosmetic items for our little rot things. And the warp point lets us teleport between different points in the map. We're introduced to the karma and upgrade system. You can get karma from defeating enemies, restoring the environment, or finding fruit for your rot to eat. I only had enough to unlock the sprinting light attack. I buy a little mushroom hat for my rot at the hat station. It's very cute. Two of the three paths were blocked, so I just followed the open one. Which leads us to this old man. Kenna tells the old man she's here to get to the mountain shrine, and the old man tells us we have to help the trap spirits here to get to it. He then gives us Taro's spirit mask, which we can use to open the spirit barrier in the village. We can also use the mask to reveal important objects and find more rot. I head deeper into the forest, exploring as I go. So far the game's been pretty linear, but there are some side paths that you can take that can get you some extra loot. I then find another combat challenge. This time I'm introduced to healing. Basically I need to have a full bravery bar and then use my rot on the blue healing crystal to heal. This is where choosing the hardest difficulty got really, well, difficult. Whenever I get hit I would lose bravery, so I would have to hit enemies without getting hit if I wanted to heal myself. I cleared out the enemies without using the healing crystal this time, because I'm just that much of a turbo gamer. I can use these orbs to turn my rot into some kind of snake-like creature, and I can use them to clear the poison that blocks my path. I can also use them to attack enemies. The bar on top of them indicates how much time they have left in this form, and the more I attack, the more that bar gets eaten up. I climb up this cliff and into another combat challenge. This time it was really hard, and I'll explain why. About halfway into this fight, I had to fight another Sprout boss, and this time it was with other enemies, so it got pretty tough. I died one two, and three times before I could finally clear out all the enemies and clear out the poison as well. If there's anything Dark Souls has taught me, it's perseverance. We then head into this very dark and beautiful forest area that's raining and thundering, and we see the spirit of someone I presume to be Taro. We follow his spirit orb thing to this sign, we put on our mask and have a flashback. I think the flashback is alluding to how Taro died and became a spirit, but I'm not so sure. The kids tell us that Taro's forgotten who he is and that we need to find three relics to help him remember. They say that Mr. Russo can help us and that he's up the mountain, so that's where we gotta go I guess. But first I stop for a bit just to admire the gorgeous visuals in this area. There's just something about the volumetric lighting that makes me so goddamn hard. I mean just look at it, it's gorgeous. We go up a log and through some trees and reach the Russo mountain area. I press on through the forest and find another combat area. This time I beat it first try thankfully, but I did need to use the healing crystal. I know I'm on the hardest difficulty and everything, but enemies take a lot of hits to kill. It gets pretty hack and slashy where I just kinda have to spam R1 a lot of times to kill an enemy, like the sprout especially takes a lot of hit. Which wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing if the combat system was fully fleshed out, but so far in the intro there's just an R1 and an R2 and there's not many combos I can do with them. Don't get me wrong though, I'm still enjoying the combat, but a lot of these encounters take me like 5-10 to 10 minutes to complete and most of it consists of me just running away from the enemies and trying to just juggle them back and forth so I can hit one and not get hit by another one. Like usual, I clear out the poison and I continue. I'm just now realizing that that gold orb thing is actually one of Taro's memories, so that's what we're following. And that's also what we're having flashbacks to. His memory leads us to this thing and we use the mask to look through it. If you're confused by that, don't worry, I am too. After that we use the worm thingy to save this statue that's been surrounded by poison, and that nets us enough karma to buy a new upgrade. After that I keep climbing the mountain. 
What's wrong with Rusu's house? The trees look funny. Let's keep going. Agree. So we keep climbing and I reach an Assassin's Creed climbing section. Of course, no adventure game is complete without one of these. I never find them a bad thing, but I always find them kind of tedious and boring, as well as repetitive. There's no real challenge to it, it's just push the stick and push A if you have to jump. But in Kenna especially, the platforming is just really floaty and I, I don't know, it's just not my favorite. After about like 10 minutes of climbing, we reach this section, but there's a bridge that's broken that we need to cross. Luckily our unpaid workers can come and help us fix this. Thanks guys. We reach Russo's house which has been overrun with corruption, so we gotta go around. After that we reach another combat section, and at this point there's no problem clearing them all out. So that's exactly what we do. We open this door, head through, and in there there's a really dark cave. And through that is another boss. This guy's name is Kappa, and he's... really annoying actually. His whole boss fight consists of just popping in and out of these three holes and lobbing grenades at you that spawn enemies. So what you just have to do is run towards him, dodge the grenade, and trying to get as many hits into him as possible before he digs back into the ground. And then you have to kill the enemy he spawns before he pops back up so you can rinse and repeat. And at this difficulty, every hit I got on him was basically just like me throwing peanuts at him. It did no damage whatsoever. It was pretty much like whack-a-mole but with extra steps. Once you got his health down low enough, he'd sometimes go up on that cliff and start lobbing a ton of grenades at you. I found it pretty easy to just dodge by just running around the place, hoping not to get hit, and that usually worked. After about 15 minutes of this repetitive boss fight, I killed him, and thank god. I honestly dreaded the thought of having to fight him again, so I really tried hard. Thankfully he wasn't that hard of a boss, so I got him. Cleared out the giant corruption flower, and I continued on. I reached an elevator that took me up the mountain, and once I got up there, I just ran through the forest, and I met with Mr. Rousseau. She's here to help Taro. He tells us the power of the mountain shrine is connected to the forest. Once the shrine's power began to fade, the balance and harmony of the forest was negatively affected. He also tells us that Taro and his siblings lost their parents to a famine that struck the village. After telling Russo we needed something to break through the corruption at his house, he gives us the power of... a bow and arrow. That's definitely not what I had in mind, but it's cool nonetheless. He lets us do some target practice with the bow and arrow, and that's probably where I'm going to call it. It's been such a blast playing this game, I'm probably going to continue. Please, please, please leave a like and comment if you made it this far. It took me so much time to edit down all this video. And subscribe if you want some more gameplay commentary things like this. Anyways, thank you. Have a nice day. Oh, and uh, Happy New Year.